Hey, Sean, how you doing? Good. How are you doing, Manny? I'm doing. I'm doing pretty well. A little, a little tired, but uh, but pretty good. My little guy has me busy. I bet. I bet. <laughs> so, I definitely wanted to have you on because uh, I want to talk to you about entrepreneurship, what it means to own your own business, to sell a business, how to even start a business. But before we even get into all of that, two things. First, can you kind of tell us a little bit of what you're up to now? And then uh, I'll have you kind of start us off at the beginning and talk to us a little bit about your childhood and your upbringing. Sure. Uh, right now, I have a new, uh, a new business venture uh, called uh, Encore Strategic Consultant. And I am doing direct consulting and coaching um, and peer groups for entrepreneurs. So really, it's an opportunity for me to share all that I've learned over the years and, and, and hopefully, hopefully uh, have people learn from the mistakes I've made so that they don't make them. Um, but it's just great helping people achieve their dream. And, and uh, you know, in a certain way, it's paying it forward because there were so many people along my journey that helped me out for no other reason that they just wanted to see me succeed. Um, and I've found that in the entrepreneurial com community, uh, entrepreneurs want to see other entrepreneurs succeed. So, um, so this is just my way of paying it forward. Oh, that's awesome. And I mean, and sometimes I'll speak for myself. I, um, <clears throat> my wife and I own some property and we, we started an LLC and everything like that. And, uh, it's sometimes it's, it's tough trying to find, uh, a community of people that you can get together and get some advice from. So I think it's, I'm sure you have a lot of people that are looking for that and, and it's cool that you're, that you're offering that, you know, and helping out people. Yeah. You know, it's, it's been great. And um, the great thing about those communities is, you know, I learn as much as I help other people learn. So, you know, it's a two way street. Gotcha. Now, before we get into some of the business stuff, can you share what your upbringing was like, like growing up? What are you, what are you doing as a kid? What's your, what, what, uh, what does your environment look like you growing up? Um, I was kind of all over the place. Uh, I, I was raised by a single mom. Um, my dad really wasn't in the picture. And, um, you know, we bounced around a lot. I went during grade school. I went to a, a different school every year. And, uh, but I had a constant in my life and my grandparents and, and they were really the constant. And at one point I went and lived with them so that I wasn't bouncing around so much, but they really showed me, you know, what, what hard work and dedication to family will get you. So, so, you know, I, I certainly had a tumultuous life at times, but, but I always had that constant that kept me grounded. Um, but, but even as a kid, um, I was always starting up business ideas. I remember mm -hmm. as a kid, I, you know, I had a, a, a shoveling driveways in the winter uh, for money and organizing other kids to do it with them, um, doing bicycle repairs. I was always mechanical. I did a lawnmower repair business for years. And then, then um, when I was in high school, me and another friend who was uh, very into cars, we started up uh, doing uh, oil changes and tune-ups and auto repairs, and a, a lot of our teachers were, were our customers. So, um, so there was always this entrepreneurial, um, I guess, drive that, that I've had since I was a little kid, because it was always about ideas popping up and, and wondering how I can, you know, turn that into making a living. How old were you when you started your first business, like as a kid? Like, what are we talking about? Five, six, seven? Um, Older. You know, an official business with business cards, junior high school. Uh, mm -hmm. I did, I was into photography and I started doing, uh, I started doing um, passport photos and, and uh, uh, pictures of people's pets. And um, so did some of that. Um, but um yeah, I mean, I've had several, uh, several different business types. I did the photography, I did the auto repair, as I mentioned. Um, then 
Um, I, I had a career as a police officer for many years, but I still had that entrepreneurial drive and I, I got a federal firearms uh, license and, and sold uh, firearms to the different police departments and to the cops for their off-duty weapons. Um, I had a handyman business with another one of the cops who had been in construction. Um, you know, uh, none of them really kind of took off. I mean, we made enough to make some extra pocket money. Um, matter of fact, you can see uh, behind me here, I got some scuba tanks. Mm, yeah. I, was, I was a member of the police dive team. And then I figured out the insurance companies needed divers to pull the stolen cars out when we'd find them. So I started up doing, uh, doing uh, scuba diving professionally, uh, salvaging stolen cars and other things that the insurance companies were pulling up. It, it paid for my, my diving. And e even now I, I, just, I went and got my, uh, my instructor certificate. So now in the winter I'm in Aruba and I work in a dive shop, you know, a few days a week teaching scuba dive. So. So it sounds like you've always had your hand on, on something or exploring ideas. Where do you think that that comes from? Because that's not, um, you don't always see that. So was this, was, were there people around you that owned their own businesses? Is this something that was just natural in you? You know, I think it was just something that was naturally in me. Uh, my grandfather who raised me had been a, a police officer and a police detective in New York City. Um, my mom was a teacher, so not a very entrepreneurial family. I know one of my great grandfathers who, who died before I was born, um, he kind of had an entrepreneurial streak. So maybe, maybe it's in the DNA. <laughs> <laughs> Got to code it in. Um, what, um, how was school like for you? Cause it sounds like you were interested in a lot of things. I'm thinking that maybe you didn't do that well in school, but I'm not sure. I, I don't want to assume. Is that the case or? You know, when I, when I went to a class, I did well in it, but I got bored real quick and I wound up not going to class a lot. I actually dropped out of school when I was 15 years old. And uh, I jokingly say I'm the high, I'm the, I'm the most highly educated high school dropout you'll ever meet. Cause yeah. <laughs> you know, I have a, I have a master's degree now. I have a couple of undergraduate degrees. And uh, so it wasn't that I was against learning, but I didn't work well in a structured environment. I kind of wanted to do things at my own pace and my own speed. And, and uh, um, I, I'm, you know, <laughs> Um, my attention span is not uh, real good, uh, so I, I tend to chase a lot of squirrels, even in my business life. But, but that really became a problem when I was a kid in school. And you know, I, I often say that, and uh, you know, only half joking. But I think if I was a kid in school today, they probably would medicate me. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, I, I think just having those ideas and being all over the place got me to where I am. So I certainly don't regret it. I had a lot of, uh, uh, I had a lot of great experiences after dropping out and bouncing around. I worked as a mechanic on a formula car race team for a while. I was a firefighter in New York. Um, I, I, you know, got to dabble in all kinds of stuff and, and that in and of itself was an education. Um, I do think today it's amazing the opportunities that kids have for education with things like VLAX and being a, and homeschooling and just being able to adapt your um, learning environment to what fits you and how you learn. Uh, and I think that was something that was, was uh, seriously lacking in my age. Um, I, I remember, matter of fact, I remember going to a teacher uh, I was failing an English class, yes, yet I was doing all this creative writing on my own, and I brought her the books, and I said, this is what I'm doing. This is the writing that I'm doing. She said, well, it's not the lesson, so it doesn't count, and I just remember just shaking my head and walking out the door, and I was done at that point. Um, so, you know, um, it all works out, though. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> so, it worked, you know, it worked but, out for you, definitely. I mean, I think that... Um, you know, not everybody has your story. So I'm hoping, you know, we'll discover some of the why behind that in, you know, in, in this conversation for sure, because, uh, you know, I feel that uh, there are some people that do drop out and, you know, they don't get, you know, their, their um, whatever, they don't graduate out of high school, they don't get a degree. And it's almost like 
they just they feel bad for themselves and just kind of settle for whatever some minimum wage job you know manny i i think the the one factor that was always there even when i dropped out of school um the things i did afterwards the things that took me through the different career paths I've had that, you know, and the reasons that I've gone back to school and I continue now at this age to continue to go back to school is I, I always had a tremendous amount of curiosity. And if there's one factor that I think you need to have to go through life and, and be successful is you've got to have an innate sense of curiosity. Um, when I left school, it wasn't because I didn't want to learn. It's because I didn't want to learn what they were feeding me. Um, and it wasn't at my pace. So I said, you know, I had, I had a guy who said, hey, I need I need somebody to drive around the country and tow my race car around and work on it and set it up for the pets. And I thought, I can learn a lot doing that. I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I dropped out of school and got my driver's license and next thing you know, I'm, I'm towing this race car around and I, I learned tons of things, you know. Um, Would you but, say that you had a lot of uh, self-confidence? Because uh, I think yeah. that, uh, you know, somebody would, would go through school and see people around them that are doing well and may think, well, there's something wrong with me. But it sounds like in your case, you were like, well, I'm not going to learn this in this way. I don't like this. I'm just going to go try to find my own way somewhere else. Yeah, I would, I would say there was always a certain amount of confidence. Um, and, um, you know, even I, I think back to, to job interviews, I mean, jobs that I've interviewed for, I have very rarely not gotten it on the first or second interview. So, um, you know, I was I was 19 years old and I got hired as a full time police officer. And I look back, I go, what the heck were they thinking? <laughs> you know? I mean, I wasn't even old enough to buy my own bullets. You had to be 21 to buy the bullets. I had to, the, the police chief had to go with me to the supply store to get my ammunition. So, <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I knew what I wanted. I, I always knew what I wanted at any given point, and I never let anything stop me from getting it. Um, you know, no is not something that I, I take easily. Uh, if somebody <laughs> says no, it just means I have, to, I have to figure out a way to get around them. Right. <laughs> <laughs> or over them or through them. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, it's so, it's so crazy. I've had a few interviews, and uh, that's one of the... Um, the things that we at some point end up talking about is that unfortunately there, there are plenty of people that see a wall in front of them and uh, give up instead of thinking of other ways to get around it, you know, and seeing what other possibilities are, are out there. But that's interesting. It sounds like, so you had the, uh, the photography business, you were fixing up cars at some point, you were doing some stuff with, uh, you said uh, you were a fireman? Yeah. Yeah. I was a firefighter for uh, How do you end up in, in, in the police side of things how, how does that work it's so different um, <laughs> you know and I, I guess it really comes down to another um uh another um um trait that that has done well for me in that when i see an opportunity i don't hesitate i'll dive in with both feet i don't usually think about it for very long because and i don't say well i'll deal with it next time because to me when an opportunity comes in front of you there may not be a next time so why not take advantage of it now and um so the way i wound up in police work was that um, i was in the fire department and um one of the guys that uh, I was in the fire department with said, hey, I'm, I'm going to drive up to New Hampshire and I'm going to take the test for the Salem, New Hampshire fire department. Um, do you want to come up with me? So it's really nice up there. My uncle lives up there. Um, we can go do some hiking, some fishing, which I was into at the time. So I was like, sure, I got nothing to do for the weekend. I'll, I'll take a ride to New Hampshire. What the heck? And we're sitting there at dinner with his uncle and his uncle was chief of police in Raymond, New Hampshire. And, um, you know, the uncle asked me, well, you know, do you plan on staying in the fire department? Do you plan on testing for New York City? And I said, well, 
I said, you know, my goal is to take the test for, for um, NYPD because my, my grandfather and my uncles were all NYPD cops. And I thought, you know, I'll probably go into police work and follow in their footsteps. And he said, uh, well, he said, I, I said, you know, I'm just waiting because in New York, they usually won't hire you until you're 24, 25 years old. And he said, well, heck, New Hampshire, we're begging for cops and we'll hire you as young as 18. So he said, I'll, I'll send you some applications. And I figured it's just polite dinner conversation. And But about a week later, I get an envelope in the mail and I got an application for New Hampshire State Police and I got uh, an application for the Milford, New Hampshire Police Department and filled them both out. And um, I missed the cutoff for New Hampshire State Police on my age by about two months, I believe it was. Um, but Milford took my took my application and uh, I had already gotten my GED at this point. So I had my high school diploma and um, I went and I took the test and I interviewed and uh, about three or four weeks after that conversation, I am packing up my truck with everything I own, moving up to New Hampshire. And I go into the town hall, I get sworn in, and they hand me a badge and a gun and say, you're, you're on midnights with, uh, with these guys here. And next thing you know, I'm sitting in the police car going, what the heck happened here? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, it, you know, the opportunity came up, and it wasn't anything I planned on, and I just I jumped at it. Um, and, you know, through, throughout my life, I will tell you that, that nothing has ever been based on a plan. It's just been a, a series of fortunate events um, and opportunities that have presented themselves. And, uh, and when they present, I, I jump at it. And some of them work out, some of them don't, but I certainly give every one of them a shot. That's, that's, um, that's interesting that you say that because uh, I feel like some people might have, might be afraid or scared of um, taking a chance. And I think it's almost maybe taking a chance on themselves, right? Like, you know, you've never really, you hadn't looked into being a cop too, too much since then, you know, um, you hadn't studied for this test and then you get this opportunity where somebody's like, Hey, this might work out. And your immediate reaction is, Hey, sure. I'll give it a shot. I don't have anything to lose. But I feel like so many people just uh, will say, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll consider it. But then something, I don't know what it is, to be honest, that it just kind of sits there and they never, they never give it a shot. It's almost like, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if it's a society. I don't know if it's a society thing. I don't know if it's a school thing. But I just feel like we kind of frown upon people trying new things. It's, it's really weird. Well, and I think the, the key is there that so many people are afraid of failing. And, and so what? You know, I mean, I, I went, I took that test. I didn't study for it. I, you know, just winged it and it was fine. I did very well on it. And, uh, but the reality was, was let's say I had gone up there and I had failed the test. What's the loss? Because even when you fail, and certainly I've had failures and I've had things that didn't work out, but you learn from it. And you know, you certainly know what not to do next time, which is more information than you had before you did it. Right. So <laughs> why wouldn't you do it? I mean, to me, that's, that's, you know, even, even when I started my company, man, I mean, I made so many mistakes along the way, but every time I made a mistake, I said, okay, I know not to do that again next time. Um, and it was a, it was a never ending learning process, but you have to take that information. You have to process it, but, but, to me, um, don't be afraid to fail. Fail when, when you fail, you're just that you're one step closer to succeeding. I mean, that's you know that you gotta you pick it. You you say now I have more knowledge now. The failure gave me knowledge, um, and that may, means I'm going to be that much closer to succeeding the next time I try that thing. Um, you know, you look at science. I mean, we've learned more from failures and accidents than we ever do from successes in science. So same thing applies to life. And, and, and I do think the problem is that way too many people are afraid of that failure. And to me, bring it on. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's okay. Yeah, and I think it's, it's something about when, 
when you're growing up, you almost like don't want to be ashamed. And, and I was just kind of mentioned that there's, there's been several books that I've read that uh, just make a, make it a point to mention that you really do learn more from failing than, than from succeeding. I had a professor in, in college once where um, he had us working on a, on a circuit and man, everyone in that class was struggling because he didn't necessarily give you the steps to, to uh, figuring out uh, the voltage, I think, to whatever circuit we were working on. And at some point, he, I think some kid was just like, can you just give me a hint? Can you give me like the answer or something? And, and the professor just simply said, you're going to remember how you fix this through this struggle. If I just told you, you would forget it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I've heard that many a time. And it's true. I mean, you know, pain has a way uh, of, of, you know, adding to, to memorization. <laughs> you know? um, but yeah, uh, in life, you almost got to learn to love going through those growing pains because that's what they are at the end of the day. Oh, well, you know, it's funny. I, I often, I always say to, to st my wife, Stacy, I said, you know, I only learn the hard way, but I do learn. <laughs> <laughs> so. that's, the that's the important thing I think that don't fail and don't and not take anything away from it if, if you're going to try something and let's say you do fail make sure that you come out with some experience out of it you know right I mean you know so many people allow the failure to define them and they 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 are devastated by whatever the failure was. And the way to look at it more is, um, okay, what do I know now that I didn't know before? How would I do it differently the next time I have the opportunity to, to do this same thing? Um, you know, or, or sometimes you learn it's not your thing and that's okay too. Um, but I think you have to be careful to, um, to saying, well, it's not my thing because you just don't want to go through the possible pain of failing again, right. which, which to me, that's not the right answer. Yeah. And I think it's, that, um, a fine line there. Yeah. I think that, uh, it's, it's interesting because I think it's so true. I mean, you know, you're not born knowing for the most part, even you learning yourself and what you like takes, takes time, failure experiences. And it's, uh, it's kind of interesting that, in the model that we have for school, it's not about you, you know, what exploring the arts, exploring math, exploring all these other subjects to see what you're really interested in. But we just kind of say, okay, we'll, we'll teach you some general stuff. And then now we're going to need you to pick something that you've thought about that you may want to do. And now we want you to go to a college and do this for the rest of your life. Where to me, it it didn't um, reign true to me, but thinking back, it's just kind of like, we change so much as people, you know, it's, it's kind of crazy to think that you, I mean, some people do, but that you're going to be doing the same thing, or you're going to, are you going to be interested or have the same passion for the same things for, uh, you know, 10, 20, 30 years, I think at a fundamental level, you may, but maybe not necessarily with the particular thing that you've chosen to do. When I was working on my undergraduate degree, I had a, uh, a professor who said something that really struck me and he said most uh, most people are going to change careers at least five times in their life and it's probably not going to have anything to do with what they went to school for is where they're going to wind up and i thought wow really and i thought that seems like an awful awful lot and you know here i am at 55 years old sitting here and and I've been through at least five if not more yeah <laughs> it might even be more I haven't actually done an actual count and if you want to add side gigs then I'm really way over the, <laughs> the five um and it was true and um um the the funny thing is I, I when I went back to college when I decided okay I, you know I'm gonna go I'm gonna go to college here and I'm gonna work on a degree I didn't know, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I went into the degree program declaring my major as sociology, because I figured being a police officer at the time, I was a detective and 
I think sociology is kind of, you know, the human condition and good thing for me to learn doing what I'm doing. And, um, you know, maybe I'll, maybe I'll adjust it to public administration or something like that. And the second semester that I was in college, um, I had to sign up for classes. And the only class that fit my schedule was a computer class. And I went to the, my advisor and I said, I want nothing to do with computers. I do not want to be in this class. I, I don't like the things, scares the crap out of me. And they're like, look, it's a required course. You're going to have to take it. It's the only thing that fits. Just go in, suck it up, and take the class. And I went into that class, and I had the most amazing teacher. And the way he started explaining computers and what we could do with them and how they worked, it just clicked. And I'm like, whoa, I get this. And, and it really it really lent itself to my mechanical abilities, the way my thought process worked when I worked through a mechanical problem. All of a sudden, I thought I, I realized that, hey, this same thought process works perfectly here in this computer. And by the time that course was over in that one semester, I went out. I remember I had to max out three credit cards to buy my first computer. It was a 286 SX um, with a Hercules monochrome graphics card, and it had dual floppy drives running DOS, I think it was 3.0 at the time. Didn't even have a hard drive. And had that thing home, had the thing, I had taken the cover off on it, gotten inside into the guts. I had, found some magazines, ordered some parts, and I had the whole thing all tricked out, and I wound up adding hard drives, and I was just like, whoa, this is it. And uh, I hacked into a, a local computer magazine's local bulletin board service at the time, back in the days before the internet, mm -hmm. and uh, I just thought this thing, this was awesome. And um, I wound up changing my major to, to computer science, and, <laughs> and I wound up getting a computer science degree and a business degree, and kind of the rest was history. And, um, and and then I found and then I found ways to incorporate it into what I was doing because in police work we were just starting to computerize, and one of our part-time police officers was a full-time software engineer at digital equipment. And he wrote a records management system and he needed some assistance uh, installing it in the departments that he sold it to. So I started working with him and started pulling cable and learning how to hook up microvax computers. And um, then uh, and then I started bringing the uh, the skills into the police work and doing computer crime investigation, which was a brand new field. Um, I started do. I was one of the first persons in New Hampshire doing computer forensics. I, I wound up teaching it at the uh, police academy for a while. And so, so I found this interest and then I figured out how to incorporate it into what I was doing. And then one day I saw an ad for a part-time computer tech and I thought, well, I better do something here to kind of keep these skills current while I decide what I'm going to do. And the guy saw my resume, called me all excited. He goes, I can't believe I found a cop who knows computers. And he explained that he had this computer company, but that he had written a software package for police intelligence. And he needed the tech to do the technical work because he was busy with all this software that he was now selling to the FBI, the DEA, the Secret Service. And he had me come up, hired me on the spot, and I wound up working for him part-time doing tech work, but then he started sending me out to, to, the, to all these places. And I have, a, I have a pile of hats someplace from all the FBI offices where I installed the software and all the different police departments. And I wound up traveling around the United States on my time off doing installs for him. And, and I really brought the two career paths together. Um, but then it got to a point where I was working all my time off uh, and all my days off doing computer work. And then I was coming in to the police department nights and I was running the detective division at the time. And, um, and the, uh, one of the companies 
that I was doing the part-time work with offered me a contract position that would that I would actually make. I was making more of my days off doing the computer work than I was than I was full-time as a as a commander of the detective division in the police department. So, um, you know, my my wife was my kids were kind of not too thrilled the fact that I was working twenty four seven and and. Uh, Know, you know, Stacy had a, and I talked and she's like, I don't care which career you pick, but pick one. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, I had had a good run in the police department. I had always wanted to make it into detectives and I wound up running the unit. So I was very happy with where I, I'd gone in that career. Um, and it was time to move on. I mean, this, this thing was taking off and that's how I started Paradigm because I had started it part time as a police officer and then it really needed full-time attention and and you know and again about that 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 high threshold for risk we had just purchased a new house and a new mortgage i had a, another kid on the way and uh you know most people if they went to their wife and said uh, hey i'm gonna quit my government job with guaranteed benefits and pension you know that i've been at for 15 years because i have this idea that i can start a computer company and her response to me was that's what you want to do. Go do it. We'll figure it out. And really? uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, you, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, entrepreneurial success is having the right partner. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, I, think, I forget which book it was that I that I read, but uh, one of them was make sure not only you should you should find a partner, but make sure you find the right partner. And the the whole logic behind it was that. Um, people spend so much time and waste so much time dating and meeting people, not only that, but also the emotional investment, that that's time that you could be allocating to something that you could be building or something that you're interested in. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's definitely interesting that that was uh, one of the key points in that, in that book that you need to find the right partner. Um, it seemed like it was a, a key point because, you know, you, you do see a lot of people that especially today that are hesitant to marrying and they want to stay single as long as possible because they don't want to lose that freedom. But it's also like, yeah, you may have some freedom, but at the same time, there are other things that you're investing your time in that you could be investing in something else. Right. Right. Absolutely. You know, you could be going on to, to bigger and better. Exactly. How um, old um, were you when you, when you made that switch? Uh, let's see. I was about uh, uh, 35 years old. 35. So, yeah, I started the company. I started the company at 31. I did it part time for about four years. And I, I resigned from the police department in uh, uh, October of 1999. And I had, uh, I was just shy of 15 years there. So that's crazy. But That's yeah, fun. so I mean, it's, you know, it's not like I didn't have a lot invested in it. Yeah. So, but, but again, it was just the opportunity was there. Right. You know, don't waste a lot of time overanalyzing it. Just go. You know what? I'm, I'm sure if it hadn't worked out, I could have gotten my job back, at, mm -hmm. you know, if not at that department at another one. But, you know, um, uh, I used to joke around, say I never went back to an old girlfriend or an old or an old employer. So, <laughs> when I'm done, I'm done. <laughs> How long um, were you do? Were you juggling both things? The, uh, uh, about, four, about four years. Four years. Yeah. Wow, that's, that's four years. You didn't have a lot of time on your hands then. It's police work. Yeah, I mean, it started out, you know, it started out gradual, but it was, I mean, it, I mean, I was working full time at both jobs at the end. So, so um, but, but, you know, the, the good thing is it gave me a great ramp. So um, I was able to, because of doing shift work in the police department and that I could work nights there and work days doing the computer, it gave me a, an opportunity that a lot of entrepreneurs don't get where I was able to ramp up and get the revenue up to a point where I knew it was going to be, it was, it was already more than what I was making on the other jobs. So, mm -hmm. so I didn't have that time where I was giving up salary and in hopes of getting the revenue up. Um, you know, I mean, if you look, you know, over the years, 
I mean, the, the, the revenue that we had, the income that we had was always going up. It never, we didn't have, we didn't have to take a dip while I figured out how to, how to make the business work. I was able to do that in the part-time area. I, I, I learned enough about the business process where the business was, was running, it was healthy. It was a healthy business when I made the cut. So that was, that was a luxury that a lot of people don't have that I did have. Is, is that what you recommend people do if they want to start their own business to try to do it as a side gig first? And the reason that I ask is that, you know, you read online and you really have some entrepreneurs that say you should start something on the side, make sure that it's something stable or something that you can do and then make that leap. And there are others that say it's not going to work unless you go 100 percent in. Oh, no, no, that's crazy. I mean, you know, I've seen so many people jump into things that they really don't understand. It seems like a good idea, but they don't really understand the nuances of it. And it fails. And, and you know, then they wind up in trouble. And I mean, especially if you have a family, um, you know, anytime you can try it as a side gig and, and test the waters. I mean, even in business, when I make changes to my business now, we do what we refer to as tests. We, we have an idea. We, 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 um, we develop what's called a minimum viable product or MVP. So what's the, what's, the, what's the thing that I can develop here with the least amount of investment of money, least amount of investment of time, but still come up with a product that somebody would, is willing to buy? So you come up with that minimum viable product, and then you put it out in the market. And you test it. And you go, huh, people like that. All right, let's put some more money into it. Let's develop it further. Companies do this all the time. You know, um, a company is not going to take something from an idea and immediately put millions of dollars worth of production effort into it to find out that it failed. I mean, some have, and that's why they've gone out of business. But smart companies do they, you're always testing your markets. You, you do just enough where you can get a product to market to see, does it really work? Does the idea make sense in the marketplace? Are people willing to trade their dollars for what your idea is? So that's all you're doing. You're doing the same thing that companies do every single day by doing it as a side gig first. You're developing a minimum viable product and you're testing the market. Once the market says, yes, we find this valuable and we will continue to give you our money for your idea, then you can say, great, now I'll, now I'll kick the government job with the guaranteed pension because the market has told me that, this, that it wants what I have to offer. So, so yeah, you should absolutely do it as a side gig, you know, I mean, why would you give up, you know, your income and, and, and your ability to pay your bills if you don't have to? I mean, sometimes you have to. Sometimes you do have to make that cut. You have to make a choice. But there are very few things in the entrepreneurial world that you can't, that you, that, that you have to do that with. Almost anything in the entre entrepreneurial world you can test. Mm. And I strongly recommend that. And, and like you say, even... Even when I, once I had a business, we were always testing out new ideas, new markets, new strategies. And, and I do that now to this day. You know, we, we spoke about fear a little bit, and I think that's, that's a great answer to two people that say, oh, I'm too afraid to try something. It's like, you don't have to quit your job. You don't have to stop doing what you're doing now to do that thing. You can do it on the side, test it in, and like you said, if there's, if there's a demand for it, people will pay you. And eventually if you're, and also if you're good enough, right? Like if you're good enough and your product is good enough, then it'll be evident, right? But the revenue coming in. Yeah. And you know, we, we talked about all the different moves I made in different careers where I just saw an opportunity and jumped. I don't want anybody confused jumping at an opportunity with being reckless. Every time I jumped at an opportunity, it was because there was clearly um, an opportunity to do better than I was doing before. And, and while, I, while I certainly have a high risk threshold, 
between police work, fire work, you know, uh, <laughs> entrepreneurial work. I mean, yes, I, I'm, I'm a high risk person, but I'm not a reckless person. I mean, even the scuba diving, I mean, you know, everything is, is about um, mitigating risk. And it's all, but I mean, it's high risk, but it's managed risk. And I know exactly what I'm gambling. I know exactly the things that I can do to reduce the, the likelihood of something bad occurring. Um, and I work very hard to make sure that we mitigate those factors. So, so yeah, so don't, don't confuse high risk with recklessness. So here's, so here's the question. How did you, what was your, your train of thought or how did you go about mitigating the risk going from a government job to now something where everything is reliant on you? Like you're going to be the business owner. Everything is solely on you. You don't have a boss to report to or to more, uh, how would you say that kind of cover your back when, when, stuff hits the fan, as you would say. So how did you mitigate that risk? What stuff did you put in place? What did you think about? What steps did you take to allow you to be able to make that jump? Well, number one, it wasn't my first business venture. So I mean, I had all those other side gigs that I had done. So I understood the business environment. Um, this time I had invested heavily in my education. So I, I had gone to school for these things. Um, I, I'd been learning. Um, I also knew that I had enough experience um, in police work and enough of, uh, you know, a reputation and a, and a resume that if I had to go back, it probably wouldn't have been difficult for another department to pick me up. Um, and, I, and I knew that and I had seen people do that. So I knew that if I had to fall back, I could fall back on that career. I'd lose some seniority in a little bit, but it, but it wouldn't be, um, it wouldn't be fatal leaving there. Um, again, I had a wife that was very supportive of the, of the move. Um, you know, she had a home daycare business that she was doing. So we had some revenue from that. Um, and, you know, she had worked in restaurants, uh, managing and waitressing for years. And, and she said, you know, Hey, I'll go out. I, I, I can go out and waitress on the weekends. You know, we can bring in the rec extra revenue. Um, it'll be fine. You know, and, and that was that was her take on it was, you know what? We always figure out how to make it work. We'll figure this one out too. Um, so we had, we, you know, we had alternate revenue streams that would support us. Um, I had the ability to fall back on the other job if I needed it. Um, and And, you know, I, ha I felt like I had the life experience at that point to be successful at it. Life experience. Let's talk a little bit about that because <laughs> especially in the world of entrepreneurship and starting your own business, I mean, being an entrepreneur at some point was like looked down upon. And I think now in our society, it's more like, it's almost like you're a celebrity, like entrepreneurs are now like the new celebs of, of the internet world. Yeah. And, you know, you see a lot of young people that are, are um, aiming for that, to be an entrepreneur, where this wasn't the case before. Yeah. Um, speak about the life experience. And I think that it's, it's good to have the entrepreneurial spirit. And I, I don't think that you should ever lose that. But I think that sometimes people jump a little bit too early um, in life without getting some, some of that experience that, that you spoke about. Well, the question is, how good are you at zigging when everybody else zags? Um, you know, or when you realize you've made a mistake, how quickly can you recover from it? And, you know, the one thing that I tell all the entrepreneurs that I work with is, I really feel to be successful, one of the qualities you have to have is being a lifelong learner. And I mean, you know, I have behind me here a shelf of all kinds of books. I have two or three more bookcases in my office with, with books that I've read. Um, I have probably a thousand books on my Kindle. I have a reading list that I give to entrepreneurs that I work with that's over a hundred books that I recommend they read all of them. Um, you know, I am always looking for a better way to do things. And, and believe me, in my entrepreneurial journey, I made some dramatic 
stellar mistakes. Um, you know, I, I pissed off my staff to the point almost everybody walked out one day and I was there left with all these clients that needed to be serviced and almost nobody left to do it. Um, I remember taking help desk calls and Stacy walked in, she goes, oh my God, this is like watching an episode of Undercover <laughs> Boss where you realize the guy who owns the company can't do the work anymore. <laughs> it, was, um, it was very humbling. Um, I had to change the way that I, I communicated with people. Um, you know, I had to, I had to change my ideas on, on effective management. Um, you know, uh, and that's just, that's just the, the culture side of things, which, which I'll tell you right now, the technology is the easy part, you know, <laughs> running a technology business. You know, uh, you find that in engineers, they fix stuff, you know, but managing engineers and, and managing all the different personality types in the technology business or any or any company for that matter. That, I think, is the area that people gravely underestimate. Um, and that was the most painful learning process for me, you know, but but looking back now. It's also the most rewarding that I was able to overcome it, and, and I was able to, and and you know, hopefully, I think I'm a little bit better person because of it, um, and, and I can share that with other entrepreneurs. I mean, and I I have, you know, there's a couple of clients I have right now, and I can see them going through the same battle because they're just very dominant personalities, and they don't realize that they're scaring their employees to death. Um, and, and I'm trying to explain to them, you know, you got to be, you got to be the kinder, gentler dictator here. <laughs> I mean, so it's your company. It's still okay for it to be a dictatorship, but it's got to be a benevolent dictatorship. Um, you know, and that's a hard lesson to learn. It certainly was for me. Um, but luckily I had, like I say, I had a lot of good people around me. You know, I had a few key people that, that stuck around and, and helped me get through it. Um, I had some great advisors. I had a peer group of, of other business owners that supported me through it. Um, and, and having those support systems is absolutely critical to getting through those times. You know, <clears throat> nobody does it on their own. I mean, I didn't, I didn't do this on my own. You know, I did it with the help of a lot of people um, and a lot of other entrepreneurs who just wanted to help me for the sake of that that they just wanted to see me succeed and, and not for any benefit of their own. And, and um, you know, that's kind of a unique thing, I think, to the entrepreneurial community. I mean, we talk about one of the terms you hear thrown out a, a lot is co-opetition. And I had a lot of people who were direct competitors who actually helped me be successful. Um, that's kind of an unusual concept for, for some people to understand, but, um, but I've helped out and I've helped, I've myself have helped out, out a lot of competitors and, um, you know, we find that there's more benefit to working together than there is trying to cut each other's throats because there's plenty of work out there for anybody who's good at what they do. Um, you know, so the key is, you know, you, you always have to be willing to get better. You always got to be willing to change your mind. You, you've got to be willing to have, to accept the fact that, maybe you were wrong in the way you were handling something and maybe you need to learn a little bit more or mature a little bit more or grow up a little bit more um and that's a never-ending process i mean like i said i'm still going through it um i'm learning every day you know so so you mentioned that um culture and it, i think it kind of boils down to the culture that the culture of a company could either make or break uh, a, a company and it stems from the top. And I definitely do agree with that because, uh, you know, if, if you're an employee, you know, working for a company or a manager, there's only so much say that, that you have or that you can express before you're more or less looked at as like the Ottoman now. And I'm speaking from personal experience. Um, and, and I want to talk about culture because, uh, I mean, I don't know if, not many people know this, but I did work for, for your company um, at a point. And, and I'll tell you, still till today is one of the best cultures that, that I've ever been a part of. And I've, and I've been part of companies that I've left because the, the culture was just terrible. Like it was just toxic. Um, 
and Paradigm had such a unique culture that I can't even put it into words. You just, you came in there and you just felt like everybody, and it seems kind of cliche, but like we were all a family. And when you got in there and you needed help, it wasn't like you were looked down upon. I was like, all right, let's, let's see what we can do. And it almost seemed like everybody cohesively was working towards one goal. And well, that's, that's very tough to, to, to find in companies today. Yeah. And, and you know what, Manny, I'll tell you, had you worked for me maybe six or seven years beforehand, you wouldn't have seen that. Because I'll be the first one to tell you that, you know, the reason everybody walked out one day is because we had a terrible culture. Because I had come from that police work environment where everything was very top down, do it because I said so, um, not necessarily a nurturing or trusting environment and a very rigid top down structure. Um, and as much as I didn't like that, and that was one of the reasons why I left, it was really the only example of management I had ever seen. And that's what we fall back on, you know, and, you know, there's an old saying, sometimes you become the thing that you hate the most. And, and, and I found out that all of a sudden I was acting like the managers that I despised and, 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 um, you know, it, it, it took some coming around for me to get to that. But, but, you know, but again, I learned, I learned the hard way, but I learned. And I realized that you can't treat people like that and expect them to give you their best. Um, and I realized that the most important job a leader has is taking care of their people. You know, and, and, and so many people think, well, all these people work for me and they're going to do what I say. And that's how I started out. And in the end, I found out that, no, if I want this to be successful, I work for all of them. They don't work for me. I work for them. And my job as the leader is to make sure that, that they feel safe in the environment, that they feel like they're contributing, that they have a voice in the company. And when I can provide that, then the best work comes from them. Um, I'll share with you a, a book that I'm reading right now. It's called Turn the, the Turn the Ship Around. This is a workbook, but there's a book called Turn the Ship Around. And uh, it's by this guy here, L. David Marquette. And he was the commander of a nuclear submarine. And Tom Mitchell, who you was my number two person, who was your boss for a while, um, Tom was actually, Tom was a submariner, was actually at the same base as uh, David Marquette's ship. And Tom said, oh yeah, I know that. I knew that boat. They were terrible. This guy took over the worst performing boat in the entire Navy. And over a couple of years, he turned it around to not only the best performing boat in the Navy, but performing way above the number two. And Sometimes you get a leader where there's a cult of personality and they do, people do great, but when they leave, that, that stops. Mm -hmm. And when he left, it didn't stop. It went on for years and everybody under his command went on to high leadership positions, either in the military or even in civilian life. So it was, it was uh, they blew the statistics off of, off of uh, all of that. But what he, imp what he teaches is intent-based leadership, where you implement leadership at all levels. And the idea is you empower you, your teams to make decisions. And, and, and instead of the boss walking around telling everybody what to do, um, when you've implemented this correctly, people come to the boss and say, I intend to, because mm -hmm. they're already thinking about the solutions. And when you have a whole team of people um, thinking about solutions, you know, you can do some really cool stuff. And in fact, there's a, there's a um, I'll give you a quote in here that I thought was very powerful. It says, and Albert Einstein said, the significant problems we face cannot be solved at the same level of thinking we were at when we created them. Mm. Okay, so that, that's a very, you know, that's a very powerful statement. It's a very true statement in my experience. But there's also another quote here from, from Captain Marquette, which is, you may be able to buy a person's back with a paycheck, position, 
power, or fear, but a human being's genius, passion, and loyalty, and tenacious creativity are volunteered only. The world's greatest problems will be solved by passionate, unleashed volunteers. So that's the type of thinking that changed the way that I managed that allowed the culture that you saw, which, which you know, uh, uh, which I think continued to get even better after after you went on. And I don't even know that we hit the pinnacle of what it could have been. And you know, a lot of what I'm trying to do is to teach this stuff to entrepreneurs now, so that maybe they can do it a little bit quicker than I did, and a little bit with uh, without as much pain as as I ran into to learn those lessons. Um, but that's powerful stuff. And, you know, um, there's a, there's one of my, one of my uh, favorite quotes by Peter Drucker, who's a management consultant, kind of the, the, the godfather of modern management. Um, when talking about culture and strategy and, 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 and I mean, strategy is important. I, I, I teach strategy to, to business owners, but Drucker's quote was that stra was like culture eats strategy for breakfast. <laughs> and, and you know it's true i mean if you had to have one of those two things i'll take the culture every time because you can't execute a good strategy unless you have good culture um and and what i tell and occasionally i've had somebody throw that quote at me when i start talking about strategy and teaching it and they go well you know according to drucker you know culture eats strategy for breakfast i said yeah but what if you have the strategy and the culture right what happens then some really cool stuff comes out of it when you have the strategy and you have the culture to execute it on so and, it's, and it sounds like the the focus of the culture is to empower your leaders and, and your employees is that was that scary for you? Uh, especially, I think that anybody that wants to own their own business or be, wants to become an entrepreneur, I think to an extent, you kind of want to have your hands on everything and make sure that everything is done the way that you're doing it. And I think that a lot of, uh, a lot of people may be stopped by that, that they just want to, they want to do things how they want to do them. And they're scared almost to, to let other people do it. So how was that one? Was that scary for you? And how did you overcome that? very scary. I mean, you know, uh, I'm a control freak. And that's, you know, part of why I've made it where I did. But I also figured out at a certain point, that if I didn't learn to let go of that control freak part of me, that that was going to put a cap on how far I was ever going to be able to take our company. And, and that was going to really hold me back. And right now I work with a few companies that are have, have plateaued and they've plateaued because the, the owners won't let go. Um, and it was, a, it, I mean, it wasn't an easy thing for me to do, but, but I had to let go. And, um, you know, when we started doing growth by acquisition, we started acquiring other companies. That was kind of really the aha moment. I, I had started to, I learned to let go, but I kind of hadn't let go 100%. And I, I was kind of like, yeah, I can still reel this in anytime I need to here, um, which, which is not the right attitude. But when we started growing through acquisition, and you know, we would double with a purchase, double the size of the company. That was like a tidal wave coming at me. And I learned that if I don't let go, I'm going to drown here. So I had to let go. And that, that, those events caused me to have to finally let go, trust people to do the right thing, and, and stand back and manage the team. And, and as a leader, what I figured out was that as a leader, my responsibility is not to go in and tell everybody what to do. But my responsibility is to make sure that we have people who are competent and qualified, that and and that I have made absolutely clear what the mission is. So, so I make sure we have qualified pe people. I make sure those people have absolute clarity as to what the finish line looks like. And then the third component is I have to make sure that they have all the resources that they need to get their job done. Once I make sure that we have all three of those, I just got to get the hell out of their way. <laughs> 
And you know, once I learned to do that, that that's when you see some really great stuff happen. And that's, that's kind of the combination of culture and strategy coming together. And, and, and you know, using those, those two powerful things to, to create something new out of it. Yeah, I know. I mean, uh, I can't stress how much, I mean, I don't own my own business yet. Well, one day, God willing. Oh, you um, will. <laughs> but uh, culture, man, because you feel it once you get in there and you, you I've seen uh, leaders, like you mentioned, that um, empower you. Um, and I'll give you an example. One of, one of my previous employers, uh, the reason why I had stuck around as long as I did is because uh, my leader was one where in our one-on-ones, he was asking me, what do you want to do? Where do you want to grow? How do you think that we can improve things? It was, it was all about, I want to grow your career. I want to see you succeed. And that was so weird to me um, because uh, I hadn't encountered too, too much of that before. Um, and it, it was a weird concept that this leader was just focused on, on how I wanted to grow. And uh, I'll tell you, man, I, I definitely put in extra time and effort in the stuff that we were doing because I wanted him to look good because he was, he had my back and I had his back. And you, you can tell the people that are faking it. You know, you can tell the people that are kind of like feeding you crap, but you, you, you can tell also when, when people are genuinely looking after, after you and, and helping you grow and, and get to where you want to be. And you see the other side and, and it's unfortunate where um, you see leaders that don't feel like they have any say. And it, it, you, it's like you, you don't even have a leader. It's almost like you have somebody that you report to because you have to report to somebody. And, and that's the end of it. And, and, you know, one thing to that point that I'll, I'll correct you on something you just said, that I as a boss cannot empower you. You can only empower yourself. I, as a leader, can allow you to use that self-empowerment. Mm. Okay, empowerment, you know, again, we're talking about leadership from the bottom up, now from the top down, right. when you're talking about having a, an empowered workforce. Um, but when I, if I say, oh, Manny, I'm going to empower you, that's, that's still a top-down <laughs> thing, okay? I don't have that ability. You have to be willing to step up and, and, and take responsibility. You know, um, you know, being being empowered or choosing to use your ability to be empowered also means taking responsibility when things go badly. There's yeah. a lot of people out there who don't want to do that. There's a lot of people out there who want to wait for somebody to tell them what to do, and and there are people who, in their nature, would rather work in an environment where they minimize, where they worry more about not making mistakes. Than, than trying something new and potentially failing. And, and people who are empowered, they're okay with failure and they're okay with learning from their mistakes like we talked about before. But you gotta build a team of people who will accept that empowerment, who will accept, who accept it when you say, I want a team of people that are gonna be empowered, who are gonna make decisions, who are gonna come to me with solutions, not problems. And I, you know, I think one of the things that I told you uh, early on and I told all our employees was it was okay to come to my door with a problem as long as the next thing out of your mouth was a solution. I don't care if it was the bad solution. I don't care if it wasn't even the right solution, but at least show me that when you come to the door with a problem that you're thinking about, and here's my ideas on how we can fix this. Because those are the people that I want to surround myself with. Because those are the people who are going to make me better at my job, too. Yeah, it's almost, um, it's almost a mind shift, too, right? Um, like, you, you encounter something. And I think, I, I think even when you're, when you're starting a career, I especially remember back when I first started that if I had an issue, uh, my first reaction uh, at the beginning was, let me just go ask somebody how to fix it versus um, trying to fix it, uh, fix it myself and, and to an extent be willing to, to fail at, at fixing that thing. And now, and I don't know, to be honest, I can't really think back at a specific time where I got over that. 
Um, I think that for me, and I'm curious to, to hear your perspective, it was a combination of things. And again, I'm just going to link it to, to, to the workforce and, and, and what I do in IT is that one, um, there, was, there was a certain fear to, uh, of making a mistake and causing a, a larger issue that I think that, that stopped me for a bit. Um, I think also um, one of the two things that I think drove me past that one was the culture that allowed me to feel that it was okay to fail as long as I tried. Obviously, you don't want to take production down, but you know you got to take some calculated risks once in a while, or else you know you're never going to improve. But but two also there was a certain respect that you develop for the other person that you're going to for help where it's almost like if man if i don't do my part and i'm going to somebody else for help then i'm waste i'm I'm taking away from the things that they could be doing and i think that those two things looking back kind of helped me get over that that fear of, of just trying to fix things on my own before trying to ask for help but there are a lot of people that uh just want just want the answer you know well, I mean, I, I'm, and I'm, I know you've heard this story before, but I'll, I'll share it because it fits with exactly what you're saying. And, and when, you know, Peter Jones, who was my number three person, and Tom, my number two person, Peter was brand new. And he went off to a client and it was about 4.30 on a Friday afternoon. And he wound up doing something with their, their email server, their Microsoft Exchange server. And it crashed. It went down. It went down hard. And um, Peter worked on it for a while, but he wasn't getting anywhere. And he called up Tom and Tom came out to the client site and met him there. And Tom's doing some troubleshooting and he noticed Peter's pacing back and forth behind him. And he's just kind of got his head down and he's pacing. And finally, as only Tom can do with his Texas accent, so, you know, turned around to Peter and goes, what the heck are you doing, boy? <laughs> <laughs> Peter, Peter looks at him and uh, he goes, Sean's going to fire me, isn't he? He goes, I just know it. He's going to fire me. And Tom just burst out laughing. He goes, why do you think Sean's going to fire you? And he goes, I blew up the client's exchange server and he's going to fire me. And Tom just laughed again. And he said, look. He said, you're not going to get fired. He said, and I'm going to, he goes, first of all, he said, do you know how many servers Sean and I have blown up between the two of us <laughs> over the years? And he goes, if you're not breaking stuff, you're not trying very hard. <laughs> he goes, now, you, now, he goes, the reason you're not going to get fired is because the minute you knew there was a problem, you called me up and let me know. He said, the other reason you're not going to get fired is you didn't lie about anything. He goes, and finally, he goes, it's six o'clock at night on a Friday, and you haven't asked me when you're going to get out of here or when you're going to get home, when you're going to go home. He goes, those are the reasons you're not going to get fired. He said, I defy you to dig a hole that Sean and I can't get you out of. As long as you're honest with us and as long as you're willing to roll up your sleeves and work with us. He goes, we don't go home until the client's whole. He goes, I don't care if we have to stay here all weekend. He goes, so, you know, if you had told me, well, I got to be out of here. It's five o'clock on a Friday. You probably <laughs> would get fired. He goes, or if you hadn't told me that there was a problem. So because he goes, I can't help you get out of the hole you've dug for yourself if you don't tell me about it. And I certainly can't help you if you lie to me about it. So he said, those things will get you fired. So making a mistake will never get you fired here. So, and, and, and that was, you know, that story became part of our culture. You know, I often tell people when I ask, um, a lot of what I do with companies right now is the, one of the first steps I take with the new client is I wanna figure out what are your core values? Okay, not, not what you put up on the wall there and you tell everybody your core values because it sounds good from a marketing perspective, but what are your core values? What are the things that you do every day? Um, and I often say to people, what are the stories that you tell all, when a new employee comes in here and, and they meet the other employees at the water cooler? What are the stories that they share with them and tell them, oh, you wouldn't believe the time that this happened? And, and I, I've 
become convinced over the years that those stories will tell me what the core, true core values are. Those stories that talk, talk about the core values of the company. Um, and that story became part of our core values. You know, the, the fact that we don't stop and hold the clients whole, um, you know, that, that we as a team could do more together than we could individually. You know, we were, it was always, it wasn't about individual glory, it was about the team succeeding. And, uh, and, and the, that story was a very big part of our, our core values. Um, and, you know, like I said, that's one of the things I, I try to do with other companies now is find stories like, you know, Peter blowing up the exchange server. <laughs> Yeah, I think that um, another key point to a successful company is definitely leadership. Um, how do you find a good leader or what are the tells of, of a good leader? I, I think we definitely spoke of one. And I think that when I worked for you guys, that was one of the things that spoke to me is that when we when I was in the thick of it, my leader was in the thick of it with me. And uh, I'm, I'm so glad that we're doing this interview because I, I shared this story, but I, I couldn't necessarily, I didn't know if I could link back to you guys or not. So I, I kind of was a little bit vague, but there was that, um, there was that virus that was going around and I mean, it's still prevalent here and there where it just locks all your files and um, eventually they were going to ask you, it's like ransomware. They ask you for a ransom, you pay it. And uh, I remember one of our clients um, got hit. And eventually we ended up restoring from backup and they may maybe lost a day or two of data, but they were, you know, more or less okay. But I remember that I was, uh, myself and, and another guy were in charge of looking through the semantic logs that would come in. And as I'm going through my tickets, I hadn't put it together um, right then and there, but I, either that day or the next day, it, it dawned on me like, oh crap, I think I might've seen an alert that could have potentially either stopped this or maybe was relating to that. And in my mind, Sean, I, I'm going to be honest with, with you and everybody. I was like, uh, maybe I don't say anything. Maybe I say something. I don't know. Maybe they won't find it. Maybe they will. But, you know, I thought of it at, at the end of it and I'm like, look, if I end up getting fired for, you know, missing something and being honest about it, then that's, it's not a company that, that a company that, that respects honesty is uh, that doesn't respect honesty. It's not a company that I'm not, that, that I don't want to work for. And if I don't own up to my mistake here, then, you know, I, I'm not going to learn from it. So, I mean, you guys develop a culture that I felt comfortable enough to be able to do this, but I walked up to Tom's office. I'm like, Hey, can I, can I talk to you? And he's like, what's going on? And, I close the door. I sit down. I'm super nervous. And I'm like, look, what happened with this client? I don't know if it's fully my fault, but I worked on this ticket. This was the alert. I, I think that maybe I might be responsible for this. I don't know, but you can, you know, you can look into it. And he was just like, some managers that I'm pretty sure would have just blown up at an employee's face. And like, how could you miss this? But you know, Tom was like, I appreciate your honesty. Thank you for letting me know. We'll, we'll look into it and we'll figure it out. You know, and I left that office like, oh crap, like, thank God I'm not losing my job today. But man, it builds so much respect for, for Paradigm and Tom. It's astronomical. Well, and you know, first of all, hindsight's always 20, 20. Yeah. And you can always look back and see, oh, I should, this should have been a flag. This should have been a flag. But if I remember correctly, because you brought that alert out to us, Peter was able to build a script to look for that alert going forward that allowed us that allowed us to prevent many attacks. I mean, we were able to stop them before they got the clients before they got encrypted. I can think of at least four or five times that that alert kicked off and shut the systems down before there was any damage done. And by you bringing that forward, we were able to create that script. So it wasn't that you allowed one client to get compromised, it's you prevented four or five others from getting compromised because we share the information and we, again, we use it as a team. And it's ridiculous for people to, you know, 
uh, to yell at you about that. And I kind of say that partially tongue in cheek because there was a time that I probably would have yelled at somebody <laughs> for that because I, because I, I didn't know any better and I, and I wasn't a mature leader and I didn't understand that long-term thinking. And luckily, you know, I, we, the company survived long enough that I, that I was able to come around to that and we were able to create that environment. But, you know, that was just a learning process on my part. Um, but yeah, I mean, you've got to have that environment where you can say, you know, hey, I, I made a mistake. What are we learning from it? And, um, there was an article that I read not too long ago, and I mean, I can, I don't remember it verbatim, but to paraphrase it, the guy said that um, he made a mistake with, with a client and, and, you know, it cost the company a big contract. And he was getting called into a management meeting and he thought for sure he was walking up to get fired. And instead he walked into the room and everybody slapping him on the back and he got promoted. And the guy said, and the guy said, well, I thought I was going to get fired because I screwed up. And the, the CEO told him, he goes, yeah, but that screw up showed us where the problem was with the, with, with the process. Mm -hmm. He goes, and we were able to fix it. And we would have lost millions if we hadn't fixed that process. <laughs> he goes, you saved us a lot of money. And, <laughs> you know, and again, going back to you learn from the mistakes, but you got to be willing to apply that knowledge that way. And, you know, so, um, you know, that's all, that's all just part of maturity and experience and figuring it out. So we've, we've spoken a lot about um, leadership and um, entrepreneurship and, uh, and it obviously it sounds now that, uh, you know, you've built a business around um, helping other entrepreneurs and uh, you've kind of kept that passion. What, what has you, what had you make that shift, right? Cause now you're, you've, you've made a different shift again in, in your life where, yeah. you know, you're, you're no longer necessarily working in the technology with other clients, but now you're, you're helping leaders be better leaders for, for their company. Well, you know, again, I mean, there were a lot of shoulders that I stood on to get where I was and, and, and those people, you know, gave generously of their time. So um, part of it is that. Um, part of it is that I just, um, I, I hate being bored. I mean, the, it's funny, I was at the dive shop one day and the, 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 the guy who manages the dive shop, he's always asking these philosophical questions and I'm there at the counter getting some gear ready and he comes up and goes, what's your greatest fear in life? And I thought for a second, I said, boredom. He goes, whoa, he goes, I wasn't expecting that. A lot of people say, you know, fire, drowning, things like that. And I said, no, boredom. I said, I can honestly tell you that, that when I when I realized that that the comp that we were selling the company that, that the deal was going to go through, we were about two weeks away from from the closing on the sale of the company, and I was almost at the state of having an anxiety attack at my desk because I thought, in two weeks from now, what the hell am I going to do when I wake up in the morning? <laughs> and it scared the crap out of me. And I immediately I went online and. And I, I had started working around this dive shop on my trips to Aruba. And they had told me, they said, you know, when you retire, you know, we'd love to have you work in the shop. So I thought, okay, I'm going to sign up, get my instructor card. So I went online and I signed up for a Patty and Scuba instructor course. I signed up for that. And I thought, well, I never finished my master's degree. I want to do that. So I went online and I found a school and I signed up for, I signed up for my master's degree. And then I thought, well, I really like psychological profiling because it helps with the culture building and that. So I signed up for two or three certifications on, on, on psychological profiling. And, um, and then I thought, well, just in case, I signed up to be an Uber driver, just in case I still didn't have enough to do. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the big joke. So, it, you know, if you, if you, if my Uber profile is still up there, I have two rides to my name. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I had to do something. I was too young, you know, to stop. I've always enjoyed teaching. Um, teaching has always been a passion of mine. Um, so it kind of it incorporates my entrepreneurial spirit, my my you know desire to to make things better and with the, with the teaching, um, you know, and um, I think it's been a, it's it's been a good uh, 
this this new venture has been a great way to take pieces from all the things that I've done all over the years and all the things that I've learned from going back from when I dropped out of school till <laughs> till now. Um, and it kind of wraps them all together. And, you know, to give you an idea, I, I, I sat down and I did my, what I felt were my core values for the new company. And it's much easier to do them when you don't have any employees yet. And, uh, <laughs> like, I get to define them now and then hire everybody based on those core values. And, uh, but um, so uh, on, on, on Encore Strategic Consulting, my, my, uh, uh, my core values are uh, lifelong learning, Education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire. William Butler, William Butler Yates. Share first, profit later. As we work to create light for others, we naturally light our own way. Uh, Marianne uh, Radmacher. There is no status quo. Any business today that embraces the status quo as an operating principle is going to be on a death march. Howard Schultz, the guy who founded Starbucks Coffee. Take new paths. Do not follow where the path may lead. Go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. Ralph Waldo Emerson. And create vision. Capital isn't scarce, vision is. Sam Walton. So, um, so I came up with those core values and then I, I found those quotes to, to kind of summarize what they mean to me. And I thought that was kind of a, a good way to, to communicate it. But, um, but, you know, every one of those core values really comes from, from that journey and from the things that I longed, learned along the way, um, you know, and, um, and some of it was stuff that, that, I had to learn the hard way. Some of it was things that came naturally, you know, the lifelong learning has always been there. Um, you know, the, the, the no status quo has always been there. Um, you know, the, 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 you know, some of the things and understanding, you know, what vision was and how to implement it and, and how to take those paths, they kind of came along the way. So, but Man, it's, where, uh, it's where we wound up. <laughs> <laughs> You've lived a lot and done a ton of stuff, Sean. Um, it's awesome. And I, I think um, I've enjoyed this conversation because you, you reminded me of something. And, and I think um, it's evident in it. You're not just saying this, but uh, it's evident in your life that you really treat, you really treat it. And uh, I, I will uh, say that you'll continue to treat your life as, as a journey and really just an exploration of, of your interests and, and the things that you want to do and, you know, your focus on, on helping people. To be honest, I didn't expect, uh, I thought that, you know, having you on, it'd be cool to get some, some good experiences, some good, interesting topics, but I'm definitely leaving this conversation with, with the reminder that, you know, life is a journey. Um, fear can definitely hold you back and can hold you from a lot of wonderful things, you know, and uh, really you reminded us that fear um, can really prevent us from, from learning who, who we are and that to be being scared of failure really prevents you from, from growing and, and succeeding. Um, but I definitely want to thank you for, for this time, for the opportunity uh, to, to just talk about your life and your, and your journey. We didn't get into, kind of like the nitty gritty of like what it really means to, to have a business in the sense of like, what do you do with payroll? How do you set up an LLC? All those things that, you know, maybe some people may be thrown off and, and get scared from, from starting their own business. We'll definitely have to do a part two or something like that. But, you know, I, and, and again, that's the stuff I can hand you a book and it'll, it'll, it'll show you how to do that. that that's easy. That's, that's the easy part. You know, it, it's, it's, trying to figure out you know how do you how do you motivate people how do you how do you hire somebody and, and ask them to be the best possible version of themselves that they can be um you know i mean you mentioned fear and, and you know and uh, it reminds me of another quote you know courage courage isn't the lack of fear courage is being afraid and doing it anyhow yeah <laughs> so um 
you know, only stupid people lack fear, you know, <laughs> but, but, but you know, you have the fear, but, but you, you move on and, uh, you know, you go past it and, uh, you know, that's the difference. No, that's right. Um, man, I just, uh, I want to give you the floor to leave us with any words of wisdom. I don't want to say how old you are, but you know, you have a life, ex a lot of, uh, life experience. So, yeah, no, I already met, I already said it. I already said it. I'm 55. Um, you know, and, uh, hopefully there's still a lot, a lot of, uh, good years left and a lot of, uh, new things to learn still and a lot of things to do. Um, you know, I, I mean, I've said it repeatedly, but I'll, I'll end it with never stop learning, never stop being curious. You know, you gotta be curious. It's, it's the, it's the single most important quality to success. So. Amen to that.